I'm going to get the discussion going for about 10 minutes, and we'll, we'll open it up to the audience. John, I think you were the only one actually in the audience watching the film again tonight, and you said to me beforehand you hadn't seen it for a long time. How, how was it watching it again? Well, I, I, th I, 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 I st still cry in the same places I've always cried in. I found it very moving, and I still feel that, you know, surprisingly, it hasn't really dated that much. And, you know, the, it's a true story about true people and a true environment, and I think it still holds up for that. And uh, Umberto Pasolini always said from the beginning, I want this to be very true. I don't want it to be too glitzy in any way and, and reflect a society up north that was having a hard time. And I think that's still reflected. Simon, you, you, write, you write in the introduction to the published script of the film that it was Uberto that came to you saying that you know, he, he had this idea of making a film about unemployed men becoming male strippers. What, can you remember what your initial reaction was when he said that to you, or your initial questions were to, to Uberto? Uh, as I remember it, and you, you, it was a long time ago. And about you to lie. Yeah. <laughs> the, the pro believe a producer or a writer. I know where I'd go. Um, Uberto had... I think I remember a two or three page treatment about some men in a gym and there were two or three lines in there that were something to do with the Chippendales and you said this is interesting and I said not really. I mean the Chippendales had been around for a while and it was kind of, they, you know, they'd been and gone and were a bit tacky and they were doing the leisure centre circuit by then. And you, to me, really significantly said, no, it is interesting. In Italy, no man would take his clothes off for money in front of women. What has happened to British men that they would do that? And I thought that was a really fascinating thing to say. And, that, uh, and I thought, OK, that is interesting. And that led me on a train of thought that said, well, if I can connect that with what is going on in the north of England, where you've got a huge amount of disenfranchised men wandering around doing nothing, who'd lost the job that their dads had done and their granddads had done, and were completely lost. If you can bring those two things together and make it not about stripping, but about men, then you could have something really interesting. Uberto, you said something interesting to me earlier. You said that you, when you were conceiving this film and, and talking to Simon about it, you were thinking back only a few years before you made this film, actually, to some of Ken Loach's films, in particular Riff Raff. And you were imagining, you said that you were imagining what would happen to those characters after the story of Riff Raff, which was about a group of men on a building site, actually Robert Carlyle's in, in the film as well. But you said you were also thinking, is there a film, could you make a film which would actually appeal to the sorts of people that are in Ken Loach's films? Well, um, obviously I remember everything differently from Simon, but uh, the, the main point was yes, I was interested in. Uh, uh, the reality of unemployment. And uh, um, what I remember is one of the conversations certainly I had uh, with Simon was uh, uh, I imagined the film to be set in Wales because I knew about unemployment in Wales. I had lived in Wales for two years and I knew about minors being unemployed. And, and I remember Simon saying, I don't know anything about minors, I don't know anything about Wales, but I'm from Yorkshire and I know about steelworks. Um, and the image I originally had was indeed of uh, the guys, the c same characters from Riff Raff coming off the, s the site, uh, of the building site, which is now in flames when they left the film, and uh, um, walking in front of a post of a Chippendales and say, this is what we're going to do next. And the main reason for that was, I always uh, could not understand, I always thought it was an enormous shame for British cinema and British cinema audiences that the uh, subjects of Ken Loach's films never went to see Ken Loach films. In fact, if you wanted to see a Ken Loach film, if you still want to see a Ken Loach film, you now have to go to Paris, because after one weekend, a Ken Loach film, unfortunately, is off the screens in England. And uh, uh, there was a brief period of time when I actually imagined going to Ken Loach and saying, if you drink a couple of whiskeys, will you da would you direct a film of this nature? And then, uh, fortunately, we decided not to do that. And the 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 thing that one of the uh, things that drove me to, towards uh, uh, making a, a film as successful as possible was to try and make a film where the subjects of the film would go to see the film um, that they were represented in. So that, uh, i.e., the p 
people in a Ken Loach film would go see a Ken Loach film, except that it wasn't a Ken Loach film, it was a Peter Catano, or someone bought or et cetera, et cetera film. Um, that to me was, was uh, one of the main driving um, uh, forces for, for the making of the film. Peter, I know you've, you've said this is a low budget film, you know, with inevitable difficulties with any low budget film, but you said that whenever you were going through particular you know, moments of crisis on the film or problems, you always just thought back to how you first felt when you read when you first read Simon's script. I mean, how, how, how did you feel when you read the script? What were your initial reactions well, to it? Well, I laughed and I cried. So that's uh, a very good starting point. And I'd never really been sent a film script before. So I thought, this is good. <laughs> um, you know, I've been doing telly and short films, and it really was one of the first feature film scripts I'd ever read. And I just thought, this is fantastic. It felt really, r you know, rang very many bells with me, having been to college up north, made short films about... Uh, Sheffield Steelworks closing and just the theming of the script generally about contemporary masculinity just rang a lot of bells for me and I said all right I'll do it and if I can add to that the reason why he got the script was that he made a, he had made a brilliant brilliant film for the BBC uh, called Loved Up was it called Loved Up yeah so we met I met Uberto on the circuit on the film circuit really film festival circuit my BBC film got kind of printed up and taken around the film festivals. I can't remember where you'd done Palookaville, yeah. and we had a kind of "I like your film, I like your film" moment. And but um, the, the interesting thing with his film was that was it was completely naturalistic, uh, realistic, and a drama. Um, and in the same way that the reason why I asked Simon to write the script was, or to discuss the script, was he had written a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant script called Tower Men, and it was a, the, about a group of men and one woman, always a woman in, in the middle screwing things up, but anyway, there was one woman um, uh, who paint uh, electricity pylons. And it was a drama, it wasn't a comedy, in the same way that uh, Peter's film was a drama and not a comedy. Um, but they, were, they felt completely truthful and natural. And I think that was the most important thing that our film needed to have. It wa had to be real. It had to be believable. It had to be natural. It didn't, have it didn't want to be a comedy. Neither, well, neither Simon had written a comedy nor Peter had it written It does have jokes in it, though. So it was the kind of balance for me was trying to keep it real, keep the tone level and just steer this knife edge between pathos and comedy. And the hardest thing with doing that often is going from one to the other. It's kind of quite easy to do some comedy bits and not that hard to do the pathos. It's trying to then get people back on track the other way. And that was really, a lot of that was in the editing really of where, you know, how do you get people back? How do you let them laugh here and then let them feel emotional there? And that's where the editing process kind of went on and on trying to just get that tone right. Hugo, everyone's talking about, you know, quite rightly about the balance between the tragedy and the comedy in the film, you know, the laughs and the fact it has you know, sharp observations on, you know, on the lives of these characters. And uh, when you were up there with the rest of the cast and the rest of the crew in Sheffield filming it, did you feel like you were making something that had something to say about the world around you when you were up there in that city? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, uh, as an actor, the first thing always, always is the material you have to work with. Uh, every single one of us knew that we had... Uh, uh, absolute gold dust, this beautiful piece of writing uh, that enabled us to do what we do to do best is to like be as truthful and to uh, to enjoy enjoy our job. Um, it, it was a lovely script, and we knew that we had uh, we were able to do our job as best as we could, and we could enjoy it fully. We knew um, that it was uh, uh, a lovely piece of work that if we gave our everything to it and we en enjoyed it fully and w worked hard, that it was gonna be, uh, it was gonna be a lovely film. We had no idea how it was gonna be received, but we knew that it were, there was a message there. It, we, there was a story, you know, with effectively storytellers, and uh, I think we knew we had a lovely story to tell, and I think together we did it with, with relish and with love uh, and with great enjoyment and, you know, once we finished it, it was, uh, it was a lovely sense that collaboratively we'd, uh, we'd done something special. I think the fact that it had that, for the, the cast, I think the fact that it had that stripping scene coming up was you know, hugely bonding. It was, it was sort of like, that comes off on the screen really. They all talked about it all the time. It became this kind of thing that's gonna happen. It was like, where do you schedule it? If you put it right at the end in the schedule, you know, obviously you shoot everything all mixed up. 
you put it right at the end, it's going to become too much of a kind of tension. I was saying it would be quite good to get them to do it quite early because then they'll have bonded, but if it's too early, it's too early. But it pretty much came in the middle, I think, and so it was a great bonding thing before it for the actors and an incredible bonding thing for it. Well, once they've done that together, they're kind of friends for life, and that kind of comes across on screen. The ensemble stuff we did after that has a real feel to it, which has just come from the fact they've all stood there in front of twice as many people as this and got their kit off. Hugo, what are your memories of that of that day when you were shooting that that final scene? I have no memories, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember I remember we were extremely scared in the morning. I remember Jill, God bless her, as we as we came in, we failed. We did some pissy little scene in the morning. I can't remember what it was, and then we knew the big one was coming, and so we just sort of filed into the dressing room. And, and there was, was Jill uh, with her assistants with like trays of uh, champagne and whiskey <laughs> and pretty much anything alcoholic she could get her hands on. And we just came in to like... <laughs> <laughs> and we drank and we drank and we sat down and we thought, okay, look, guys, this is it, this is it. <clears throat> we went on and we did it and we enjoyed it. And it was hilarious. And it's that thing once you've, uh, obviously, you've got the bravado because you've, you know, you've had a, a couple of drinks. Um, and this, uh, the, the atmosphere in the room, this is 11 o'clock in a cold working man's club in, in the north of England. You know, there's nothing glamorous, there's nothing fun about this. And you know you're going to have to get bollock naked. Um, but, but we thought, well, this is it. This is what the, you know, this is the, the, the climax of the film. So... We, we, we did it with as much uh, gusto as we could. And we, we did actually just thought, well, if you're going to do this once, just once in your life, do it well. Do it with all the love in your heart and enjoy it because this is what the entire world is going to see. Um, and so, yeah, we, we did it. And, but the, the girls in the, in the audience, and it was mostly girls, you know, they were nuts. These were people, these were Sheffield, normal Sheffield girls. I mean, you'd been, you guys have been very, very clever because you'd gone to uh, the Chippendales gigs and you'd put out these leaflets saying, if you want to see some you know, TV actors or film actors do this for real, for free, come along and see them. So they all turned up in their droves. They'd been told that, you know, it's 11 in the morning, don't bring any drink. There won't be any alcohol, so we just pretend that there's the... Yeah, like, that's going to happen. They smuggled in <laughs> gallons and gallons of alcohol. So, what, regardless of the time, this was when we actually started, it's probably one in the afternoon. They were absolutely blathered and, like, baying for blood. They were just... These are the girls who just, like, you're screaming, screaming. And they meant it with every soul, every sinew of their bodies. So, you know, it was terrifying. <laughs> but, but it was magical and it was beautiful. And it was like the fact that it was only one in the afternoon, you know, when we actually did it, then it was this, this, this whole synergy in the room that it was real and it was glorious. Um, and uh, obviously you had all the cameras there and everything was, that was there was caught. It was the smart move getting all these natural reactions. It was all real. When we did do it, we did it. The audience, the girls, didn't know we were actually going to do it. Obviously, we had to go up and then, you know, cut. And it's like, oh, boo. <laughs> and we build it up again. It's like, off, 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 off. Oh, bugger. And then it was like doing it for real. They didn't know we were going to do it. So when we actually did do it, they caught the, 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 the reactions of every single moment. It was like, ah! They did it. So they saw all our... Todgers. And just to, just to interject, that was one camera placed and everybody had their marks and they knew exactly where to do it. Tom said to me, we're doing this once and that's it. So get it right. If you don't get it right, if you don't get it exposed, that's it. You've had it. And they did it. We did it just that once. Well, I think that's what helped with the crowd because we only did it once. So we spent, we did, we shot the looking towards the guys dancing for quite a while. And then they'd go up to the point of reveal and then be like, well, don't do it once. So cut. So that created this thing in the crowd where they were just waiting and waiting for it to happen. It meant that it kept them interesting. And we did all the crowd reactions first, then came round. And so we did the crowd reactions very early while they were still really up for it. Then did all the guys and then came round for just that one camera right in the center. And there's one take wonder. 
and somehow that light goes off bright between Tom, uh, Tom Wilkinson's butt cheeks, and it's just like, <laughs> thank you. It was just like, wow, that's so perfect. Uh, Jill, still talking about that final scene, I mean, presumably part of your job was sourcing or, or coming to the look and then sourcing the, uh, the red thongs for the, um, for the ensemble. We, had, um, we decided to get them made in a shop called Clone Zone in Old Compton Street. Um, uh, and we, I, I can't remember, was it scripted, Simon? Did you write Red Leather Thong? I can't yeah. remember. It was, yes, yeah. Were red Leather Thong. That's thongs. it. So um, we had to go and get these Red Leather Thongs made. And I think Peter's just said he's got a spare one. I thought we had six because we had so I've little money. I've got one money. in my loft. You've yeah. got one in his, lo in his loft. Um, he reckons we had seven. I think we had six made. And um, because we had no money, we had one of everything. So um, when we were shooting this all the time, you know, we shot over and over again the guys up to the strip. So we had to make an announcement to all these real women in the audience, you can't keep any souvenirs. You know, we have to have the tie back. Each guy had one tie, one belt, one shirt, one hat, one pair of pants. So we had to, God love them, I think Chrissy Makeup was running around collect, collecting ties and belts and the whole crew were trying to retrieve everything. Um, and I remember Bobby used to complain about his red leather thong chafing. So we had to, we, we lined Bobby's in silk. So Bobby's was all lined in red silk and everybody else had to just stick with the leather. But they became quite unsavory, didn't they, Hugo? After. Do you have a silk one? No, mine's regular leather. It doesn't they, chafe at all. They got a, no, they got a bit sweaty. So, um, <laughs> and uh, the night before we did the actual strip, uh, Tom, earlier in the film, we'd shot a scene where they were rehearsing when the police run in and they all run off. And Tom's pants were coming undone in this scene. They shouldn't have done, but they were, because the Velcro, you know, when you strip Velcro after a while, it wears off the strength. So he'd asked me to re-strengthen his pants. So the night before we did this big number, Tom couldn't pull his pants off. So I was like, oh my God, you know, and I'd, I'd reinforced everybody's pants because I thought they've got to get through this whole dance routine. If they can't pull their pants off, it's going to be awful. So we had to give Tom a quick lesson how to pull the pants off, but it was hard, you know, it was tough, he couldn't do it. So that when we were actually doing the strip and we were all drunk, I hate to say it, we were absolutely pissed <laughs> doing it because um, I brought a crate of champagne in and somebody brought whiskey and brandy chasers, that wasn't me, that was somebody else. Um, so, and I was at the side of the stage um, with my head in my hands. I couldn't watch because I was thought that all those boys are going to be up there and they're going to be standing, not being able to pull their pants off. And I remember standing at the side of the stage and there was this almighty roar went up. And I was like, did it work? Did it work? Did it work? And Tessa, my assistant, was saying, can you not hear that roar? You know, of course they've come off. So it was a bit nerve wracking now. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good point to start taking questions from the audience. I can see one here. I think there's a microphone. There is a microphone going around. I'll set up three if I can so we know where we're going. We'll start here, then we'll go there, and then anyone at the back? Oh, then there's one there. So we'll do these three, please. Um, one thing I want to ask about is the actual the effect that the film had in America and how it was perceived. And you know, when you think it was also nominated the same year as Titanic in the awards, how how did it, was there anything that um, you remember from that whole publicity tour or the effect that it had? The, the, film, was, the film was nominated for four Oscars and won one for, for score and uh, won two BAFTAs as well. Robert Carlyle won the acting prize and the film won best film. Hugo, you were, you were talking earlier about going to, uh, I think going to the Golden Globes with some of your fellow cast members. Maybe that's a good place to start with the answers to that question. We were robbed. <laughs> we were robbed. There is that thing, obviously, when we knew... Uh, that for best film at the Oscars and all that we were up against uh, Titanic, I think there's that feeling that if uh, if Hollywood is going to spend 120 million dollars <laughs> on a movie, uh, and then a humble little thing like the Full Monty that would cost three shillings and sixpence was up against it, if they'd given it to us, it would have thrown the entire industry into turmoil. So I think they had to. We knew that they had to give it to Titanic. Uh, but it, it was it, for us. It was never really about. It would have been lovely, obviously. You know, we got our we got our token Oscar, which was great. Um, I think it was it was about. It wasn't about winning awards. It was about you know uh, the how it was how it was accepted globally, how it was taken on, how much joy it gave to so many people. And I think we we knew that. We we felt it everywhere we went. Uh, 
certainly as a, as a, as a bunch of boys when, when you know, the, the, the group of us went out together in Los Angeles, um, people would uh, stop their cars and beat their horns and shout and the people we met and pretty much everywhere we went, they, we knew that, that they, they loved the film. Um, I think the, the message that it brought, you said, you, you know, recent... No one could understand it in America. That's what I was quite... You couldn't understand it. I think certainly the, 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 the human message about having, you know, the, the reason why it transferred it's to, the to Buffalo. just the Yorkshire accents, I think, that puzzled. A lot of people came out of the first screening we had at Sundance saying, I, I loved it. I couldn't understand a word of it, but I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, there was a moment when Fox Searchlight started handing out glossaries. With they did. The, yeah, yeah. With cheeky chuffer equals a naughty boy. <laughs> yeah. Because it's fuller. I mean, nobody knew the words Full Monty then uh, at all. Certainly not in America, not, not a soul. In, in, fa in fact, when we went to Sundance with it, w the title was still uncertain. And we, I remember we, we put uh, little, we stuck little things that said Full Monty, Full Moon, Full This, Full That, to try and, and confirm the title. And, if, and it was actually the reaction at Sundance that said to the American distributor, um, okay, we'll stick to this title even if we don't understand well, the it. the Americans enjoyed, the first question all the American press for me was like, what's the, what's the term the full money mean? You know, what does it mean? But I had, I did a whole press tour in, around like a different city in the US, in, I mean, like Minneapolis, Houston, Boston, everywhere, a new city every day. And uh, they loved it and they related it to like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and towns like that that have been kind of shut down. The one thing they kept coming up with was this thing about the boy and the stripping, which uh, the first time they asked me that, I was like, what they said, so how did you, how did you, you know, we were just, so how did you feel about having a young boy there with men stripping? And I was like, don't know, thought it was funny, thought he was, you know, Gaz's son, he would be there. But they were absolutely shocked and deeply worried about there being a young boy there with naked men. You're a freaking pedophile, man. You're a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get to tell you, I, I had produced a, um, a little film called Palookaville um, the year before. Uh, and uh, um, in fact, we were at Sundance the year before, yeah. me with Palookaville, or two years before maybe, me with Palookaville and you with Loved Up. And, uh, and uh, when Palookaville was released by the third company that had taken over, the sec two, second company that, that had taken over, the first company that had made the film with me, um, we were on the Sunset Drive, um, Multiplex, which is a, uh, used to be at least an art house cineplex, in and uh, nobody wanted to go see Palookaville. Nobody. They were all going to see. So I was in the queue, and I was literally offering money to people to go see Palookaville instead of the other movie that at that time was called. It was a cool movie that the Weinstein people had, um, and literally nobody went and the and it was Paluka was a lovely little film but nobody went to see it and literally a year after I was in the same queue in the same cinema and everybody was buying tickets for Full Monty and the wonderful thing about it was they were approaching the um, ticket uh, booth and just going for money for money for money for money and they had appropriated is that's the right word the, the title of something that admittedly they didn't understand, completely relaxed uh, happily, and uh, as opposed to Palookaville, which is an American term that nobody wanted to say at the box office a year before. Everybody was happy to say, um, and, and it, it started working immediately. In fact, the film started working as soon as we put it in front of an audience. Of course, nobody knew how successful it was going to be, but we had a, a research screening in Wimbledon, in Wimbledon. Um, uh, the film industry, some, the very often in fact, when it can afford it, does these research screenings that you put 30 people, 100 people, 400 people um, in front of a, an unfinished film, and then uh, you see how the, this audience reacts, and, and uh, you can even give them little cards, and they say what they like, what they didn't like, which character they like, which character they didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. And they're called research screenings. And we, they've been done in Hollywood since the 20s, in fact, since the silent um, uh, movies. 
And uh, when we had the results from the Wimbledon screening, we had the highest oh, they numbers. They were double checking it to check it wasn't. Yeah, wrong. we had the highest numbers that the organization that was doing those things, that was a, an organization that worked both in Hollywood and in England called the National Research Group, the highest number they had ever had in terms of reaction, positive reaction to a film. So that was sort of quite satisfying. And it's quite encouraging. It says it's life in America. It did quite soon afterwards become a musical on Broadway, didn't it? But that was something that I, I believe, presume none of you had anything. Well, it opened in America first as well. Did it? it did open. We opened it, it opened in America before the UK, which um, I remember was something. To, I remember people, yeah, people talking about the four weddings model, which had done a similar thing or something. And it worked. we were kind of like, really? That seems weird, but it worked. It seemed very strange, but it worked. I was, I was saying to David before that, actually it opened here, as we were saying before, the evening that uh, Princess Diana um, passed away. And in my nasty producer mode, I said, she's stealing the limelight. Uh, where nobody's going to see the movie because everybody's going to be glued in front of the television um, watching the news. And in fact, actually, we had a great first weekend. And, and the weekend after was bigger and bigger and bigger. It was quite extraordinary. I'm going to have to bring things to a close because we have run out of time. I'd like to remind people, uh, Simon did mention it, his uh, stage version of the film, Monty, which oh, premiered in, yeah. in Sheffield last autumn, is, is opening in London tomorrow night. Um, all six of you, thank you very much for such a huge, entertaining and you know, m most importantly, or equally importantly, enduring film as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.